eight, perhaps a new life. At first, neither Enrique nor Lourdes cries. He kisses her cheek again. She holds him tight. This has played out in his mind a thousand times. It is just as he thought it would be. All day they talk. He tells her about his travels, the assault on top of a train, leaping off to save his life, the hunger, thirst, and fear. He has lost 28 pounds and is down to 107. He feels fragile in her embrace. His bruises and scars frighten her. Her instinct is to hug him, feed him, nurture him. She cooks him rice, beans, and fried pork and watches with pleasure as he eats. The boy she last saw when he was in kindergarten is now taller than she is. He has her nose, her round face, her eyes, and her curly hair. Lourdes has three children, but Enrique is special to her. He is her only son. Look, Mom, look what I put here. He pulls up his shirt. She sees a tattoo. Enrique Lourdes, it says. His mother winces. Tattoo, she says, are for delinquents, for people in jail. I'm going to tell you, son, I don't like this. But at least if you had to get a tattoo, you remembered me. I have always remembered you. He tells her about Honduras, how he sold the shoes and the clothes she sent to buy glue, how he wanted to get away from drugs, how he ached to be with her. Finally, Lourdes cries. She asks about Belki, her daughter in Honduras, her own mother, and the deaths of her two of two of her brothers, and she stops. She feels too guilty to go on. Eight people live here. Several have left their children behind. All they have is pictures. Lourdes' boyfriend has two sons in Honduras. She has not, he has not seen them in five years. The trailer is awash in guilt. Children like Enrique dream that when they finally find their mothers, they will live happily ever after. For weeks, months even, the mothers and the children hold on to a fairy tale idea of how they should feel toward one another. Then their true feelings surface. The children say they resent having been left behind. They accuse their mothers of lying to them when they promise to quickly come back to their home countries or send for them. Now that the children are in the United States, their mothers are working hard and don't have time to make up for all the attention they missed out on while they were apart. Worse, jealousies grow when the children have to split their mother's attention with the children she had in the U.S. The mothers demand respect from their children for the huge sacrifice they made coming to the United States so their children back home could eat and study. They worked hard and lived long, lonely lives away from their families and children. When their children accuse them of abandoning them, the mothers think they are just ungrateful brats. As they spend time together, mothers and children discover just how far apart they are. In Honduras, Enrique's grandmother Agueda walks next door to find Maria Isabel at her Aunt Gloria's house. She has news. Enrique is in the United States. He has made it to Lourdes' house. Maria Isabel wails, He's not coming back! She locks herself in her bedroom and cries for two hours. Will they even see each other again? At night, Gloria can still hear her sobbing. For the next few months, Maria Isabel spends hours at a time silently sitting on a rock in front of the house. Cheer up, Gloria's daughter tells Maria Isabel. He's there. He'll send money. If he'd stayed, you would both have died of hunger. But Maria Isabel, normally always giggling, is inconsolable. Belki, too, is depressed. She stops talking. She cries every morning. Maybe, she tells herself, she should have gone with Enrique, taken the risk. Both he and Diana are with her mother. Now I'm the only one left here, she tells Aunt Rosa Amalia in tears. Enrique likes the people in the trailer, especially his mother's boyfriend. He thinks the boyfriend could be a much better father than his own dad. Lourdes' boyfriend helps Enrique find work as a painter. With his first paycheck, Enrique offers to buy $50 of the grocery bill. He buys Diana a gift, a pair of pink sandals for $5.97. He sends money to Belki and to Maria Isabel in Honduras. Lourdes brags to her friends, This is my son, look at him. He's so big, it's a miracle he's here. Whenever he leaves the house, she hugs him. When she comes home from work, they sit on the couch, 
watching the favorite so- her favorite soap opera with her hand resting on his arm. Each Sunday they go shopping together to buy enough food to last a week. Lourdes cooks for Enrique, and he starts gaining weight. But in time, Lourdes and Enrique discover they hardly know each other. Neither is familiar with the other's likes or dislikes. They haven't seen each other in over a decade. They are strangers. At first, Enrique is quiet and shy around the house. As he settles in, he begins to change. He goes to a pool hall without asking permission. Occasionally, he curses. Lourdes tells him not to. Enrique plans to work painting houses to make money. His mother wants him to study English, to prepare for a profession. No, mommy. No one is going to change me, he says. With others, Enrique is openly affectionate, especially with his half-sister, Diana. He gives her money, drives her to the store, plays piggyback with her, gives her hugs. He teaches her to dance. They play rhymes together. She is happy to have a big brother. With his mother, he is on edge. Their fights are often sparked by Lourdes scolding. Don't drink and drive, she tells him. Control your drinking. Be careful with money. You can't spend a thousand dollars as if it were ten. Lourdes blames Enrique's grandmother Maria. She spoiled the boy and let him run wild. Lourdes is determined to impose discipline on her son. It is for his own sake, she says. But Enrique cuts her off. He tells her she can't treat him like the little boy she left behind. He's grown up now. Didn't he fend for himself growing up? Didn't he hop freight trains across Mexico? You keep sticking your nose into things that are none of your business, Enrique tells Lourdes, adding that she should just shut up and leave him alone. You will respect me when I talk to you, Lourdes yells back. I am your mother. She walks up behind him and spanks him hard on his buttocks several times. You have no right to hit me. You didn't raise me. He tells her that only his grandmother Maria, who raised him, has that right. Lourdes disagrees. I sent money. I supported you. That is raising you. Enrique locks himself in the bathroom and sobs. He throws around anything he can find. Toothpaste, shampoo, a perfume bottle. Diana hides in the bedroom crying. Lourdes' boyfriend tries to calm her. Then Enrique storms out of the house. Lourdes' boyfriend and his cousin cruise the streets, trying to find him. Enrique hides behind a small church two miles away. He sleeps in the graveyard behind the church between the headstones. The graveyard brings back haunting memories. He recalls laying flat atop a mausoleum back in Chiapas, frantically praying police would not catch him. Now he awakens surrounded by crickets and dewy grass and a different worry. He feels guilty for storming out on his mother. He wonders if he was just testing his mother's love, testing to see if she'd follow him. Lourdes stays up most of the night. She knows he is just punishing her, making her nervous, and that he will be back. But what, she worries, will their future together be like if they are already fighting? Will they always argue this much? It seems as though the anger Enrique felt toward her for leaving has not faded over time. It has only piled up. She expected Enrique to love her like the five-year-old who clung to her in Honduras. She has been a good person, a good mother. Why is God punishing her? The next afternoon, their love prevails. Enrique ducks into the trailer and apologizes to his mother for storming out and scaring her. He tells Lourdes he loves her. He comforts her with a little white lie. He tells her he spent the night safely sleeping in her car. They share hugs and kisses. That night, they watch soap operas together on the living room sofa. As they sit side by side, Lourdes can feel her son's love. When Enrique comes Honduras, he learns Maria Isabel is pregnant, as he suspected before he left. On November 2, 2000, she gives birth to their daughter. She and Enrique named the baby Catherine Jasmine. The baby looks like him. She has his mouth, his nose, his eyes. An aunt urges Maria Isabel to go to the United States alone. The aunt promises to take care of the baby. If I have the opportunity, I'll go, Maria Isabel says. I'll leave my baby behind. Enrique agrees. We'll have to leave the baby behind. 